What's up guys, BB Online and today I'm gonna continue the story What if Naruto became the Western Emperor part 3. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this, subscribe to my channel. Now wasting no more time, let's begin. The Easterners found themselves slowly walking back to their temporary abodes as everyone else left the Colosseum to rest, enjoy the festival around town, or place bets on the tournament. Only five of the fighters they sent made it to the final section and it was mostly by chance that they didn't run into any of the Western fighters. They were certain that the Western's Teijutsu was much higher, and could only hope that the other two tournaments didn't contain such monsters as well. They arrived at their compounds to find two members of the Brotherhood carrying a box between them. The box opened before they could ask, revealing Zetsu chopped into pieces and, of course, dead. We warned you about spying and exploring places you weren't supposed to go. This is your final warning. Do not attempt such a stupid thing again, or you will all be expelled from our city. In the case of the main offender, you will be forced to give up something valuable. You don't have a choice, one of the Brotherhood assassins said before blending into the shadows they searched for them only to discover that they had vanished without a trace. They all turned to face the Odo village, furious at such a stupid act. Orochimaru was furious that Zetsu had been apprehended and killed. He'd have to explain to Pain why their best spy was suddenly and indefinitely unavailable. He had attempted to use Karin to determine how powerful these people were, but her ability was rendered ineffective due to the city's abundance of chakra, which made it impossible for her to differentiate each person's level. Each village retired for the night, contemplating their next move. Inside the Imperial Palace, Naruto was enjoying his favorite meal, ramen. He had made sure Tuchai and Aim had a prime spot, away from all the eastern visitors to sell their food ever since they had moved to the west. He also had a Horatian kunai hanging at their shop in case they needed it right away. He ordered five ramens for himself before returning to the palace, where Neji, Maru, and Itachi awaited him. Kasama was drinking away while their female companions, minus Itachi, were discussing female topics. How did it feel to see your relatives again, guys? Naruto inquired. They all shook their heads. Their home was the Imperial City and their family was each other. My younger brother has fallen further than I anticipated. Allowing him to live was a mistake. This would not have happened if Danzo hadn't intervened and stolen Shisui's Ayatachi murmured. It was strange seeing my uncle without saying anything, Maru remarked. It appears that my old clan now has a new heir, one who believes in the deception of the main house, Neji told them. Regardless, it would be interesting to see how my former teammate is doing now. I hope Guy was able to make him see the light. Well, show them the fruits of your training, Naruto replied. Then they all started talking about what they should do near the end of the final tournament. The following day, the entire audience returned to see the finals. The Easterners took their seats in the same location as before. A few people chose not to attend. Sasuke was muttering about the injustice and how these scumbags didn't respect him and chose to remain. He was still upset about not being able to copy others with his Sharingan, and he was warned not to use it again. The nine fighters were soon all standing in the center of the Colosseum. Everyone is welcome. We've arrived in the Teijutsu Tournament Finals. Here are the nine competitors who fought their way to today's spot. Instead of the arena where they fought yesterday, our competitors will fight today in a much larger arena. This time, there will only be one fight, but that's fine. We can now focus on a specific fight and watch as they bash their guts out. While announcing this, Kodo performed a ballerina spin. Please come to the middle, fighters from the first round. Please move to the side to wait your turn. Everyone else, remember to stick to the rules. Although I will be the referee for these matches and will provide commentary, our esteemed proctors from yesterday will be on the lookout for any signs of cheating and will stop the match if any are detected. The Colosseum ground split open in the middle, revealing an arena larger than the preliminary rounds. The first match began, and Kanishi was declared the winner after 15 minutes. He avoided his opponent's attacks with minimal movement before unleashing his strongest combo, a series of moves that knocked him out. Then there was Neji versus Lee. They stood in the middle, each staring at the other. Lee had not yet moved on from his rival. No, ex-rival. He was devastated when Neji and Tenten suddenly vanished. They exchanged derogatory words the last time they spoke. Lee had mistaken Naruto for the Kyuubai and stormed away from his teammates. It took a fist and Guy's manly hug, with the sunset of youth playing in the background, to persuade Lee of the truth. Before he knew it, his teammates had gone missing nins. He initially assumed they were on a mission, 
He realized he was now alone after a few days. Team Guy had disbanded, and Lee had only trained with Guy. Lee was finally fulfilling an old dream by fighting Neji on a public stage. Neji, my former adversary, I've trained with Guy Sensei to the point where the gap between us is clearly closing. Let me now demonstrate the power of youth and defeat you, Lee stated. The elder Furinji, who was still wearing his Geiru X mask, chuckled in the background. Another person with a youthful spirit, like himself. Are you ready, fighters? Toto asked. Then start. Lee rushed in through five gates to strike Neji. But he was met with something he could never have predicted. Neji deflected his fist and repeatedly jabbed Lee in the chest. Hatch him in Tonku reversal, Neji muttered. Lee felt all the gates he had opened suddenly close during this attack. Lee stumbled to the ground, stunned, after losing all of his chakra at once. He tried again to open the gates, but they wouldn't budge. He didn't even hear Koto count to ten, which ended the match. He jumped back when he saw a hand in front of him before realizing it was Neji offering to help him up. It isn't permanent. At the end of the day, you'll be able to open gates again Neji stated. Lee took his hand in his and stood up, embarrassed that he had lost so quickly and so badly. How did this chasm between us grow so wide? What am I overlooking? Lee inquired. Neji exclaimed. The divide between east and west is enormous. Unlike the east, you must either learn to defend yourself or become prey. I was fortunate to meet some people who could help me. Lee paused for a moment before apologizing to Neji and asking where Tenten, Naruto, and Hinata were as they walked off the stage to the side. Neji looked at Lee with his Byakugan for a moment, trying to see if Lee was lying before remembering Lee wasn't the type to lie because it was unyouthful. Tenten is now my wife. The others are. Unharmed Neji replied before leaving Lee alone to join Kanishi. Lee stood there for a few moments before breaking down and declaring that his old teammates' flames of youth were now in season and something about the lotus blooming. With Guy joining him as soon as he heard the news, their hugs soon revealed the sunset of youth. They didn't expect anyone to show up. H-O-H-O-H-O. -H -O -H -O. What a youthful display, exclaimed the elder. Garu X, 20, is also a teen in the spring of youth. Allow me to join you in your youthful embrace. He grabbed them both and hugged them, startling Guy and Lee before welcoming him in. Oh no, the elders found some friends who agree with him, Kanishi sighed. Mew kissed him on the cheek to cheer him up. The other matches were mostly steam rolls, with Ryu and Guy coming out on top. Given that no one was seriously injured or exhausted, the match with Guy and Luffy began after ensuring Guy's approval. As Guy and Luffy faced off, Guy sensed that Luffy would be a difficult opponent. Soon after, Kodo began the match, but no one moved. I'd appreciate it if you went full power, Luffy Kun. I will not back down from winning this with the flames of youth. Kamen Hachiman Tonku Deroku. Kai, Guy declared the sixth gate. His skin turned blood red in an instant, and a green aura surrounded him. The eastern villagers were now counting on Guy to get them to the semifinals and prove they weren't all that bad. Back in the east, anyone who could open gates was always someone to be wary of. The west appeared to be interested in this. The Raya's and Paku members weren't thrilled with this skill because it could rip muscles if not used carefully. But they decided that the competitor might need it to keep things interesting. They could easily assist him in recovering as long as the damage did not exceed a certain threshold. Guy dashed around the arena, attempting to confuse Luffy before attacking. Luffy, on the other hand, seemed to know where his fist was coming from and dodged it every time. Luffy attempted to punch him several times, but Guy managed to avoid it, albeit narrowly. Interesting, so your technique has improved your speed and power. In this state, I could beat you, but it wouldn't be fun and would take too long Luffy said this as he avoided Guy's flying dynamic entry. Guy arrived, intrigued by what Luffy was saying. Luffy took a horse stance before bending down on his knees. His legs appeared to pump briefly before returning to normal. Luffy's chest expanded slightly. His skin turned pink, and steam appeared to be seeping out of his body. The Westerners knew right away that Guy's fight was over, while the Easterners were still perplexed. What was he doing acting like a steam train? Did he also open gates? Because his skin was pink. But something seemed off. Gear second, Luffy declared. Take care. My techniques have all progressed by at least one level. Naruto leaned forward in the Emperor's box. He had fought Luffy with his own power when he used Gear Second a few times, and the score was won in Luffy's favor. When he used Kirama's power on him, Luffy would fight him with Gear Fourth. He was ahead by one point in their duels, but it was becoming increasingly difficult to fight Luffy, who seemed to be improving even faster than himself. During the fight, Luffy would use Hayashoku Haki to halt his movements, even if only for a microsecond. Not to mention that Kirama admitted that his punches were extremely painful. 
Back in the arena, Guy was cautiously approaching Luffy. He had no idea what Luffy was up to, but he didn't want to take any chances. He'd already seen that the majority of the Western fighters could easily handle them, and it was only by using the gates that Guy was able to avoid total humiliation. Gamu Gamu no said Luffy, cocking his fist and extending his left hand, as if ready to snipe. Guy moved forward in the hopes of reading the punch and ducking under it to counterattack. The jet pistol. Guy barely saw the punch before slamming back. He was able to react quickly enough to put his hand in front of his face, blocking some of the attack. He shook his head slightly before turning to face Luffy, only to see smoke. Rifle jet. A voice came from the side and punched Guy in the face. Guy ended up on the sidewalk, face up. When he saw Luffy coming down with a punch, he did a backflip to avoid being punched in the gut. Guy felt a shiver of fear run down his spine as the punch shattered the ground. He knew he couldn't afford to not use his move as he regained his breath and balance. So he dashed forward to Luffy. Asaku Jaku, yelled Guy, his fists on fire. Luffy shifted his gaze to face him. Gamu Gamu no, exclaimed Luffy before his arms vanished in a blur. Jet, Guy was suddenly smacked with fists that were faster than his attack, effectively neutralizing Asaku Jaku. Gattling, Guy was sent flying almost tumbling off the arena's edge. The vicious attack nearly knocked him out. I need to open the seventh gate. Even if I can't compete in the semi-finals after this, I can't lose this badly. Guy reasoned. Dainana Kaioman. Kai, yelled Guy, who was instantly enveloped in a blue aura rather than a green one. As Luffy charged towards him, he quickly took the stance for his next attack, hoping that the seal barriers located around the Colosseum audience would be enough to protect them. They'd said that even a Baijudama couldn't hurt it. H-I-R-U-D-O-R-A, exclaimed Guy, hoping to land the attack when he noticed Luffy was already in front of him, his arm trailing behind him to where Luffy had been standing moments before. Luffy's arm was covered in a shiny black material, which perplexed Guy. Black, he wondered. Gamu Gamu no Red Hawk, exclaimed Luffy as the arm returned to its original position and caught fire. Luffy's attack was the first to land, throwing Guy's attack off course and missing Luffy by an inch. The attack hit the barriers, where it was absorbed and the crowd was protected. Fire erupted behind Guy, exactly where the punch had landed. Guy collapsed to the ground unconscious and with at least second degree burns after a few seconds. And we've got a winner. This fight has been won by Luffy Senchu, Kodo declared. Luffy came to a halt, smiling into the crowd with V-signs. A stretcher arrived quickly to transport Guy to the hospital for treatment. Guy awoke just as they were about to carry him away. I guess I lost, Guy sighed. Luffy appeared next to him out of nowhere. You're intriguing. That was a great fight. Luffy laughed. Guy looked at him for a few moments before striking his best nice guy pose and passing out. All of the eastern visitors were taken aback. Everyone, including the other villages, admitted that Guy was probably the best Heijutsu user of them all and he had just been taken out. What about the other tournaments? All they could do was hope for the best. Kanishi faced off against Neji as the tournament progressed. It was a double knockout. Kanishi did his best to avoid Neji's attack, but Neji was quick enough to land a few hits and shut down some organs. Before falling down, Kanishi shunted forward, hands up at mid-waist length, before attacking with Ryusui Mabiyoshi. A devastating attack with no pattern at all. Both were knocked out due to broken ribs on one side and internal injuries on the other. They were quickly taken to the hospital to be treated. When Kotsuji casually mentioned that they would be increasing Kanisha's training, he shivered. In the final round, Luffy faced off against Ryu. Ryu tried everything he could, but even with his mastery of the Satsui no Hado, Luffy was able to fight him evenly with gear second. Ryu made the mistake of attempting to use his raging demon grapple on Luffy, and when he did, Luffy countered within a second by wrapping his limbs around him to avoid being attacked by it. He was helpless against Luffy's attack because he couldn't move. G-O-M-U-G-O-M-U-N-O-O-O, -O -O, yelled Luffy, throwing back his head and stretching his neck. His brow was suddenly covered in a shiny black material once more. Kain, Ryu, who was still struggling, decided he had only one option. He jerked his head back and slammed it into Luffy's forehead at precisely the right moment. The impact was heard as a resounding thud. Luffy let go of him as both fighters staggered. Ryu quickly recovered and shot his leg forward, striking Luffy in the stomach. Luffy flew back and delivered a right hook to Ryu's face. Ryu ducked it and thrust his fist into Luffy's stomach, attempting to remove the Shin Shoryuken. The first hit, however, was suddenly nullified when Luffy inflated himself, transforming himself into a balloon. Ryu was forced back as the fist bounced off his stomach, 
leaving him open. Taking advantage of these precious seconds, Luffy twisted his body in a spiral and jumped his back to the crowd. He exhaled heavily and spun forward toward Ryu. His hands were once again covered in haki and on fire. Damu Gamu no Hawk Storm, yelled Luffy, throwing punches so fast that many in the crowd struggled to keep up. Ryu tried everything he could to block and dodge the attack, but in the end, he took too many hits and was barely conscious. Luffy dashed up to Ryu, both hands trailing behind him. Jet Bazooka, Gamu Gamu no. Luffy smacked his hand directly into Ryu's stomach, launching him out of the arena and into the wall. By ring out, Kodo declared Luffy the winner. Luffy assisted Ryu in getting up to see Aerith while Nami cheered her husband and drooled over the prize money. Looks like I still have a lot of training ahead of me, Ryu said when he awoke. Hee hee, it was still fun. Luffy laughed as he stretched over to Nami to grab both his precious hat and Nami. Nami screamed as she was abruptly pulled over, smacked Luffy on the head, and kissed him. Ryu simply laughed at their interaction before reclining on the stretcher. He intended to find his best friend Ken and do some more training before going out to dinner with Chun Lai. Monkey D. Luffy is the winner of our Teijutsu tournament. Thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy tomorrow's tournament. It's the weapons competition. If you still need more information, the rule book is located just outside the Colosseum. Everyone have a wonderful day, Kodo declared. As the audience filed out of the Colosseum, the Easterners remained firmly seated. They were terrified after witnessing the Westerners fight each other. Although the Akatsuki members refused to admit it, they all felt that pain would undoubtedly lose to some of them. When a balloon popped, they were all startled out of their reverie. They turned to see Yakairu and Kenpachi exiting. Yakairu was giggling while holding the remains of her balloon. Kenpachi simply scoffed before ordering them to leave the area for cleaning and return to their temporary quarters. Their apprehensions about the West grew as they trudged back. Each village chief devised a unique strategy for approaching the emperor. Tsunade dashed to the hospital with Kirama's permission and direction. She arrived and immediately requested Guy. I must heal him. I am well versed in the gates and have previously treated him. She insisted. The nurse simply laughed. Don't be concerned. He'll be just fine. Dr. Kotsuji is currently tending to his injuries. His reputation is well known. However, I'd rather be there to treat my own shinobi, exclaimed Tsunade. The nurse was about to respond when Kirama cut her off. It's understandable that the village leader would want to keep her own shinobi safe. I'll take her to the patient. The nurse nodded and handed Tsunade a visitor's pass. She quickly walked into the operating room with Kirama. I wouldn't be concerned about Guy. Dr. Kotsuji is known and feared for being a doctor as frightening as diseases and treatments. Kirama stated. That's not good, exclaimed Tsunade. My point is that Kotsuji has been known to take on cases that most people thought were hopeless. He does, however, have another moniker, the Medic Demon, because most doctors who work with him end up crying in fear. Only Ma Kensei and Tony Tony Chopper have managed to work with him, Kirama responded. Tsunade entered the room to see Kotsuji wheeling Guy out. Tsunade quickly performed her medical jutsu to scan for injuries and was surprised to find that there was nothing wrong. He simply requires rest. He is not allowed to do anything that will put strain on his muscles sternly ordered Kotsuji Tsunade could only nod as she pushed Guy away. The majority of the Easterners were taken aback by the fact that they appeared to have the techniques to treat him faster than Tsunade. The legendary medic could. Inside the Imperial Palace, Naruto and his entourage were dining with Koyuki's entourage. They were discussing trade agreements while eating when Koyuki decided a change of pace was in order. How did it feel to see Konoha again? Koyuki inquired. I see the team and bitch haven't changed at all. Naruto chuckled. That is not correct. They deteriorated. Kakashi laughed. Sasuke continues to believe that everything should be at his feet. Unfortunately, that was true for some Uchiha's, though they kept their attitude to more tolerable levels. Itachi snorted as he ate his food before responding. Kakashi, that is an understatement. Try almost all of my clan's shinobi and some of the civilians. Naruto took a look around to see what everyone else was up to. Tenten was conversing with Yuffie about various weapon tactics while Hanabi was conversing with Hinata. Maru was chatting with Juria about Sarutobai, the Sandame Hakage. Kasama was sparring with Kenpachi on the training field once more. So long as Akatsuki doesn't find out where Kasama and Itachi are, everything should be fine. He was looking forward to the tournament tomorrow. So, when will the air arrive? Koyuki was teased. Naruto flushed profusely before stuttering. Don't make those kinds of jokes. Hinata hasn't even he came to a halt when he felt someone tug on his sleeve. When he turned around, he saw Hinata blushing. 
I was about to tell you something. I went to the doctor about a week ago and found out I'm pregnant. Hinata stated. Naruto was so taken aback that he had to take a seat to process the news. On the other hand, Neji was laughing. It was fated to be. Given how many times you two keep at it, Neji chuckled. Tenten suddenly began to pull his cheeks. Tenten is in pain, Edetit. What are you thinking? It might help if you know I'm also pregnant, exclaimed Tenten. Stunned, Neji decided to follow Naruto's lead and sit down. The council fell silent for a moment before everyone began to fight for the right to be the godparent. Koyuki simply chuckled before announcing that she had already reserved the position of godmother and that Naruto and Hinata had agreed. While the men fought for the godfather, the women sighed. It should be me, too san fufufu. Ukai said. You're right, too. Ukai's right hand man, said. No way. It should be me. I was the one who rescued them. Yusuke yelled. Neji didn't bother fighting for it because he already had the honor of being Naruto's best man. And he was too shocked to even argue. No way. Boss, you should make me godfather. For the longest time, I've been his student. Maru yelled. Now, everyone. Everyone knows that since Koyuki is the godmother, I should be the godfather since I'm marrying her Kakashi stated. Not only was he my student, but I also knew his father. Godfather, is that something I should eat? Luffy inquired as he picked his nose. I'd like it. Nami slapped his head in response to his remark. No, Luffy-kun, it means that if they die, the child will be cared for by the godparents. I believe I should also apply for the position Itachi stated calmly. Tenten was already busy appointing her master Yuffie as godmother and debating who the godfather should be. Leaning towards Kanishi, while everyone else on the council, both civilian and war, were fighting for the right to be the godfather. Neji and Naruto could only laugh at each other. They were getting ready to become fathers. Neji was relieved that his child would not have to be branded, whereas Naruto was simply relieved that he could be a father and start a family. The Easterners all got up to prepare for the new day. They had lost the first one but were hoping to win the second. At this point, they were willing to have even the samurai win for the sake of the East's pride. The majority of them filed into the Colosseum. Sasuke was being stubborn once more and chose to head towards the training field, while Sekiro was content to pursue him. Tsunade sighed. This act only reinforced her belief that she made the correct decision by refusing Sekiro as an apprentice. It was a shame, because her chakra control was among the best she'd ever seen. But with her attitude, it would go nowhere. Tsutomu and Orochimaru decided to join the competitors in the cage box next to Koyuki as they moved towards the arena while the others sat in the audience. Tsunade was displeased but couldn't do anything about it. Koto wasn't the tournament announcer in the middle of the arena. Instead, there was a man in a suit holding the microphone. He wore large square sunglasses, a red tie, and his blonde hair was combed back. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our weapons-only tournament. My name is Eric, and I'll be your announcer for this tournament. Here are our toughest fighters, ready to compete for the grand prize of 100 million Ryo. The format will be the same as in the Teijutsu tournament. Any attack is permitted as long as the weapon is the source of the attack. That means no using hand signs for attacks. You'll have to wait until the next tournament to find out. And don't worry about hitting anyone else. We have special seals provided by the Uzumaki clan that will prevent anything harmful from spilling out. But forget about that, let's introduce our competitors today. Today's competitors are visible on our screen. Kanoha only has three members. It took four of them until one of them decided to open his mouth and dig himself a grave, courtesy of Yoko Kirama. The other villagers who had lost a member were all competing in the Teijutsu tournament. Again, the Easterners decided to look for Western competitors. They found their name in a nice straight line. Kegura, Goranoa Zoro, Guts, and Zu. Ideas Ye Chan HWA, Kenshin Uzumakis. All the Easterners froze when they heard this last name. They now knew that some of the Uzumakis had made it to the West. But the name terrified them. Tetsu was wary of a famous swordsman. He had defeated a younger Mifune, annihilated an old generation of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, and was known for his sword style, the heightened Mitsurugi Ryu. It was said to be so fast that any shinobi who tried to make hand signs in front of him would find themselves without hands and legs. He was said to be the strongest swordsman in Yuzushiagakure, protecting the cage in that village. During the invasion against three major villages, the man took to the front lines and slaughtered many by himself halting many invasion plans and earning him the nickname Batasai, the Manslayer. When Yuzushiagakure finally fell, Kiri, Kumo, and Iwa assumed he was dead. Except for Hamura, the older generation of Kanoha Shinobi felt a different chill. What was unknown was that Kenshin was actually Kushina's younger brother, making him Naruto's uncle. Kenshin had survived, 
what he had agreed to hide for a while for the sake of his people's safety. Amira was shaky in his shoes and pissed himself. When Kushina died, he immediately sent a request to adopt Naruto. The reply informed him that Naruto died during the sealing process, so Kenshin left for the west believing he had no one left in the east. Not realizing it was a lie perpetrated by Danzo, Hamura, and Koharu, Sarutobai had never seen the letter and had no idea what it was about. Meanwhile, Tsunade could only hope that she could persuade the emperor, despite the fact that the difficulty had just increased. He was known to be fiercely protective of his family. They all hoped it was just someone with the same name. Their hearts sank as they scanned the western competitors. Long red hair in a ponytail, wearing a red kimono and white hakama and his famous cross-shaped scar on his left cheek from the invasion. His usual fierce expression had changed to one that was more calm and happy. Okay, fine. Let's see who's fighting who. We have 42 competitors this time, so nine fights will take place right now. The second set will immediately follow, followed by the final three matches. Following the completion of the first preliminary round, there will be a 30-minute break. After that, we'll have 21 competitors, so someone will get a pass on that. The following day, we'll be able to have 10 competitors competing for glory and money. Announced Eric. I hope we fight someone interesting, the white-haired man named Nzu said, looking at his sword. The Easterners thought he was insane when the man's black sword with a creepy red eye suddenly responded. They, I want to fight Lamia. Show that BTCH who has the better sword. Suddenly, the sword with long black hair seemed to emit some light which soon formed into a woman. Take that back. Idenin will triumph over you. Now, now Lamia, Ide said, trying to calm his sword. No need to be so antagonized. Oh, great. Talking swords now, Suaijsu thought. And I thought our swords were unique. Naruto took a look around to see who his fighters were up against. Zoro had killer B. Guts was fighting Suaijsu with Kubikirabacho. And Meliodas was fighting a Kirinin wielding Shibuki. Gara became concerned when he saw Matsuri fighting Hidden. He wanted to jump down and tell her to give up, but he couldn't. If he did, he would be displaying weakness in front of the other villages. He could only watch helplessly, gripping his hand and hoping the proctors would protect her. Sensei is going to win this hands down, Karui predicted. Yeah, Killer B is going to win so badly that the opponents will feel hot, exclaimed Atsui. I'm not so sure, a voice said. They turned around to see Ujido had decided to join them. What do you mean? Darui asked. Surely a unique style like B will surprise them. You'll find out, Yujito said, sitting next to Samui. How boring? Darui remarked. Imagine it all happening. Arena 1. H-O-H-O-H-A. Finally, I get to sacrifice someone for Jashin. Hidden laughed uncontrollably. Kotsuji was just staring at him, and Matsuri was scared. She took a deep breath and prepared her weapon, the rope dart. She had read about Hidden's abilities and hoped that her technique could subdue him because Hidden was apparently immortal. Matsuri did her best to avoid and counterattack as the fight began. Hidden became enraged and swung his weapon down. Matsuri jumped back, but the impact of the weapons pelted her with rocks. She had to close her eyes and made a mistake. Hidden took advantage of it by quickly slashing up, causing a small cut on her cheek. Hidden performed his ritual quickly, licking the blood. Haha, you lose, exclaimed Hidden as he stabbed his leg. Matsuri screamed in agony as a hole appeared in her leg. She gave up when she realized she couldn't win. Kotsuji nodded and declared Hidden the winner before telling him to stop. You can't stop me from sacrificing someone to Jashin. Die, little girl. Hidden yelled as he was about to plunge his weapon into his heart. No, yelled Gara as Orochimaru grinned. He was surprised to see Koyuki unconcerned. A few seconds later, the reason became abundantly clear. Hidden abruptly dropped his weapon. Matsuri screamed in pain as her hands were also dislocated when he looked at his. My apologies, madam. I had to intervene to prevent this idiot from murdering you said Kotsuji. Hidden was furious. How dare this person prevent him from sacrificing the girl to Jashin. He was up next. I already have an idea of how your ability works. That's why I've already taken steps to put a stop to it said Kotsuji. Hidden quickly looked down to see that there were rocks missing from his circle that he had drawn on, rendering the ritual ineffective. Hidden tried to hit him when he felt his world spin. He was thrown and forced into an extremely awkward position. Forced into an agonizing, destruction hell, yelled Kotsuji. Hidden tried to move but discovered that he couldn't even move his pinky. The only thing he could do was scream obscenities, which were quickly silenced by a seal. Hidden is disqualified. In this match, no one will advance. Kotsuji stated calmly. Gara let out a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding. 
he'd have to personally thank Kotsuji for saving Matsuri. Hidden's defeat had Orochimaru palming his face. Pain had even told Hidden to control his temper and religious seal. But Hidden hadn't bothered to listen. Damn it Hidden, I'll kill you for costing us money, muttered Kakuza. Arena 4. Suaijsu was perspiring profusely. He hoped that by using Kubikiribacho, he could frighten his opponents. But his opponent, who was dressed in black armor, had a sword that was at least as large as his, if not larger. Suaijsu had to put extra chakra into his muscles to wield his, but his opponent swung his weapon with ease. Suaijsu was quickly disarmed by an upward slash and almost killed by a subsequent downward slash had guts not stopped one centimeter before hitting his skin, demonstrating his mastery of his blade. Give up, said Guts. Suaijsu numbly nodded, and Guts lifted his blade and placed it on his back. Suaijsu ran in front of him as he walked away and bowed to him on his knees, his forehead resting on the floor. Teach me how to use a sword, begged Suaijsu. Guts was perplexed for a moment and decided to continue walking away, despite Suaijsu's pursuit. May could only sigh. Guts appeared to be a good man as well, but seeing one of her shinobi chasing after someone was depressing. Arena 7. Dai Shrimp yelled the Kirinen wielding Shibuki. Deidara was yelling about art being an explosion, cheering on the shinobi with Shibuki, hoping to see explosions. Meliodas sighed I don't have time for this. I need to check on Hawk to make sure he's not pigging out again. He swung his sword upwards, stopping the opposing sword. Ha, huh? you fell for it, exclaimed the Kirinen. Explosions went off, but not in the way he had hoped. Instead of going towards Meliodas, the explosions came back at him knocking him out. Full counter buddy. Meliodas lamented as he walked away. Arena 8. Haha. <laughs> 8 is my lucky number. Prepare to be hacked and sacked by me. Killer B Bakayaro Kanoyaro. Wrapped B as B continued to embarrass himself. The cloud nins all had clouds over their heads. Zoro simply drew his three swords and placed one in his mouth. Santoryu. Meet my Nanadoryu Bakayaro Kanoyaro. Take a look. Because I'm about to give you a taste of my hook be exclaimed as he chucked his swords up and caught them all in his signature pose. Zoro raised an eyebrow, intrigued. B suddenly jumped and flipped forward to attack. The rakage was watching the fight with interest, as it was his younger brother who was fighting. He was astounded to see Zoro deflecting B's ferocious attack without breaking a sweat. Even with all of the acrobatic moves that would normally confuse someone, Zoro accepted it without blinking an eye. Then Zoro attacked. Not bad, Santoryu. Kokyujo, Tatsumaki. Zoro spun in a circle before a cyclone formed. B was sent flying away from the attack. He made it into the arena, but two of his swords were broken, and a cyclone of blades was still coming his way. Cursing, B quickly jumped above it to enter it, spinning in the opposite direction with a lot of chakra from his tailed beast. The tornado had been neutralized, but he was still breathing heavily. What's the matter? Is that all? Zoro asked, smiling. Hee <laughs> hee, not even close to Doe's. Wrapped B as he threw two blades and charged forward, thinking Zoro wouldn't have any range attacks. Zoro simply grinned, sending shivers down his spine and abandoning that plan. Idoryu 360 pound who? A beam of energy shot out of Zoro's sword, shattering the two blades thrown by B and continuing forward until the seals absorbed the attack. What? Darui wondered. That was a powerful sword attack. They can perform flying attacks without using chakra. Mifune was taken with the attack. It didn't appear to be a flying sword slash, but rather a cannonball. It's time I put an end to this fight, Zoro declared. This may be overkill, but... Zoro moved his arms before they left solid after images. He now had three arms on each side, three heads, and nine blades. Kiki Kudoryu, Asura. Really? Zoro. Asked Wang Fei Hung, the arena's proctor. Oh my goodness, what exactly is that? Karui yelled. Are those real? That is extremely hot. Atsui yelled. Crap, he has more swords than I do. Thought B. I told you guys, Zoro is one of the strongest swordsmen in the West, Yujito said. He can easily take on s rank nins. Even with Matabi's abilities, I couldn't beat him. I hope you're ready, Zoro said as he charged forward. B attempted to flee, but it was too late. Megurin. B met the attack head on and collapsed, knocked out. Before B was taken to the hospital for treatment, Zoro was declared the winner. Not bad. Maybe we can spar again someday if you improve your sword technique Zoro remarked as he sheathed his swords. He was supposed to walk to the west's waiting, viewing room, but he went the wrong way. Zoro. Wrong way. That's the case. Wong Fei Hun yelled causing Zoro to blush. I knew it, exclaimed Zoro as he walked in the direction Wang Fei Hung had indicated. The only problem is that Zoro has a terrible sense of direction. 
he gets lost far too easily. Never let him take the lead, Yujito explained. Since the first round of preliminaries was completed, the board quickly randomized the second set. Naruto noticed Kenshin fighting Asuma, Inzu fighting a samurai, ID fighting Atsui, and Kagura fighting some Iwanin who was leering at her. That match was going to end quickly. Orochimaru tried to release some of his snakes while everyone was distracted. These snakes would bite someone and leave a cursed seal. With luck, he'll be able to control them and steal some valuable information. And if he's successful, he'll bite Koyuki and one of the cages. However, as soon as the snakes slithered away, weapons appeared from nowhere above them and pierced their heads. The cages and Koyuki were taken aback by this sudden movement until they noticed the snakes pinned beneath. They were furious at Orochimaru for attempting such a heinous act. A tan man with white hair stepped out, wearing a red button-up cloak black pants, and a black shirt. Orochimaru, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave this area. You can't expect us to tolerate such behavior, especially when we're close to other leaders. Comply or die, though I'm hoping for the latter said the man. Orochimaru found himself staring at a dozen weapons pointed at him. He saw no other option and agreed. The swords vanished as soon as he walked away. Thank you very much, Archer, Koyuki said. The other cages were perplexed by the name. He didn't look like an archer with that many swords. The match began before they could question it, so they put the question aside. Arena 2 Before we begin, this one must ask you a question, Kenshin said. Why did Kanoha treat Naruto so poorly? And why did the village lie to me about his death when this one sent a letter requesting to adopt him when I learned about the Kyubai attack and Kushina's death? Tsunade spun around to face her advisor who was staring down at his feet. Tsunade had never received any letters from Kenshin about Naruto, and she was certain that the Sandame Hakage Sarutobai had not either. The majority of Kanoha's civilians thought Naruto was the fox. Even some of our village Shinobis agreed. Naruto was filled with misplaced fear and anger. If it helps, my father and clan never thought of Naruto in that way. I don't know anything about a letter. And I don't think my father received one either Asuma replied as he prepared himself and hoped he would live. He hadn't expected to be fighting someone so powerful with such a legitimate grudge. He didn't want to leave his wife a widow so soon. I see, Kenshin replied. This one appears to be blaming the wrong part. Perhaps some roots needed to be investigated. Kenshin's eyes suddenly turned fierce, sending chills down the Easterners' spines. This was a face they all recognized. The face he used to fight with. The face of his famous nickname, Badaosai the Manslayer. Asuma gulped before attacking. Kenshin blocked the attack before ending the match with a slash to the chest. Kurenai clutched her bleeding hand as she saw her husband take a slash to the chest. However, it didn't appear to be a fatal wound because medics were already repairing the damage. Tell your Hakage I will certainly be looking for those responsible for denying my nephew his birthright and family. Kenshin said as he sheathed his blade. Arena 4. Enzu decided to show off a little. He slashed the ground, causing rocks to fly up. Before the samurai could react, Enzu slashed through the rocks with his blade, sending everything flying to the samurai and knocking him out. Arena 6. You're hot. Do you want to go on a date with me? Said Atsui. You do realize I'm a guy, don't you? I heard you made the same mistake before. With his eyes twitching and a vein on his forehead threatening to burst, ID said. What? Man, that's not cool said Atsui. The match began and ended quickly. ID would deny taking his rage out on Atsui. Arena 9. Kegura won the match by using her fans to block and attack physically. She wore a dancer's kimono, which perplexed her opponent. She had pointed ears, red eyes, and a beauty that didn't seem human. Mifune was the only noticeable fighter in the last three matches, fighting against someone from Odo and easily defeating him. A 30-minute break was issued to help heal anyone fighting in the next round. Suaijsu was still attempting to get lessons from Guts at the time. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that, exclaimed Eric, because we're about to enter the second round of the preliminary round. Nobody will receive a pass because one of the matches was declared null and void. Instead, we'll play 10 matches to determine who will compete in the tournament. And here are our matchups. Kenshin vs. Samui. Darui vs. Kagura. Zoro vs. Yugao. Guts vs. Kirinin with Kabutori. Anzu vs. Kirinin with Nuabari. Meliodas vs. Suna Nin with Staff. ID vs. Odo Nin. Shijiro vs. Samurai. Mifune vs. Iwa Nin. Temuri vs. Aomoi. Okay, everyone, please return to your respective areas so we can begin. Stay back. Temuri and Aomoi announced Eric. Arena 1. Kenshin ended the match quickly, using the back of his blade to knock Samui unconscious. She fought hard, but it wasn't enough. Arena 2. This is boring, Darui commented. 
Kegura's eyes twitched slightly before she took out and spread a dancer's fan. Darui was intrigued by this action, but decided he needed to end it and win, or Elsa might blow a blood vessel for not having any of them reach the second day. He opened his sword and channeled Chakra into his body, allowing the black lightning to surround him before channeling it to his sword. He dashed forward, hoping to catch them off guard. Kegura only smiled before swinging her fan. Blade dance. Wind blades grew towards Darui, who blocked them with his sword. This move, however, prevented him from proceeding. As if that wasn't enough, Kegura kept making more of it. She can manipulate the wind that easily with a small fan, exclaimed Temeri. She looked at her own fan, which was much larger and about chest height. Darui had to dodge or block Kegura's attack, and he'd had enough of it. He got into his stance quickly, leaping back and throwing a shuriken at Kegura to temporarily stop her. Typically, this move was performed with hand signs and used his hands as a guiding attack. However, because this was a weapons tournament, he had practiced with his sword, albeit not as accurately. Not bad. Try this for one. Kegura changed her attack and swung her fan quickly. A strong gust of wind was heading towards Darui. Darui was blown off the ring, but his attack still flew towards Kegura. There was an explosion, and the arena was covered in dust. Darui shook his head, checking to see if his attack had been successful. Temri was astounded by what she witnessed. As the dust settled, a wind barrier encircled Kegura, blocking all of his attacks. Apapapa, Kegura has won. Apachai, the match is proctor. Announced. Arena 3. Dance of the Crescent Moon. Yugao tried every trick she knew, but Zoro easily deflected all of her attacks. She soon overextended and discovered two blades crossed right under her head, almost cutting into her neck. Zoro was quickly declared the winner. Arena 4. Haha, my sword was designed to demolish any defense. I'll break your sword, said the Kiri Nin wielding the Kabutori. Unfortunately, he grossly underestimated Guts' Dragon Slayer sword's reach. The last thing he saw was the flat side of Guts' sword slamming into his face. Arena 5. Why can't I hit him? How can he see my attacks when they're nearly invisible? Yelled another Kiri Nin. Nzu was having fun dodging and deflecting the Nuabari blade until his sword spoke. Stop fooling around and just finish this, or I'll reveal your secret to Ayrmi. You wouldn't dare, stupid blade, yelled Nzu as he avoided another needle. I will if you don't stop this person from shooting needles into me, said the blade. Nzu growled but complied. He swung his blade in an arc, slashing the air. The swing was too fast for the civilians and some of the shinobis to see. The Kiri Nin was perplexed until she noticed a gust of wind coming straight at her. She jumped back up to attack, but a blade was pointed right between her eyes. I think I win, little miss, Nzu said. The Kiri Nin could only growl and accept defeat. Arena 6. Meliodas chose to parry the Suna attack. Nins which perplexed some of the Easterners as to why he didn't simply use his full counter move. While fighting, he wore a shirt advertising his drinks and made sure everyone saw it before finishing the fight. Arena 7. Die, bitch. I told you not to call me a BTCH. An indescribable veil of carnage descended between ID and the Odo Nin. Iwork Ds rendered the Odo Nin unrecognizable. Chajaru triumphs in Arena 8. Nifun triumphs in Arena 9. Temeri and Amoy's battle was soon underway. Temeri was irritated as Amoy expressed all of his concerns. She finished it quickly with a wind jutsu and a smack to the head. After she finished, she challenged Kagura with a stare. Kagura smiled. All right, we're done with today's section, exclaimed Eric. Now let's see who fights who the next day. Will the contestants please come up and announce the number you get? The numbers were quickly drawn, and each competitor displayed theirs. Match 1, Temeri vs. Kagura. Match 2, Zoro vs. Guts. Meliodas vs. Kenshin in the third match. Match 4, Inzu vs. Mifun. Match 5, ID vs. Chajoru. So, then, the winner of match 1 will face the winner of match 2. The same goes for 4 and 5. After the winners of matches 4 and 5 square off, the winner of match 3 will face the winner of matches 1 and 2. After that match, they'll have an hour to recover. Then it's time for the finals, announced Eric So. Enjoy the rest of your day and get some rest. I guarantee you don't want to miss tomorrow's fights. The rakage was in a bad mood as the Easterners returned to their current quarters. None of his fighters, not even his own brother Killer B, had made it to the finals. That Zoro swordsman was out of the ordinary with four extra arms and two extra heads. It gave him the appearance of a demon god. He shivered as he considered it. It made him resemble Asura from some of the temples he'd seen, fighting a god in human form. What kind of people were there? The other village leaders were not pleased that they were unable to knock out even one of the western fighters before the second round. Gara turned to Yujito, who was accompanying them back, 
as they returned. I'd like to personally thank the Proctor Kotsuji and the Emperor for protecting my shinobi, Gara said. Isn't that girl special to you? Yujita was teased. Gara was lucky to be wearing his sand armor. Otherwise, Yujita would have seen a full-fledged blush on Gara's face. Gara continued as if her statement had never happened. I'm also curious if Gara looked around to see if anyone, especially Kanoha, was listening in Naruto, my burdened brother, has arrived. When I learned of his exile, I dispatched Shinobi to find him and offer him refuge in Suna, but they never found him. They only knew Naruto had crossed the wall to the west. Yujito examined Gara's posture and face and concluded that Gara wasn't lying. She approached him and hugged him. To anyone looking, it appeared to be a regular hug. Yujito, on the other hand, whispered into Gara's ears while dropping a piece of paper into his pocket. Follow the directions. Meet at midnight, when everyone has gone to bed. Gara was perplexed when Yujito left after the hug. He complied, however, and did not inform anyone. He was desperate to see Naruto again. By midnight, everyone had fallen asleep. They had no idea that the Brotherhood had sprayed sleeping gas made by, forcing everyone to sleep peacefully. Kara was unaffected because he had followed the instructions and stood in the location specified in the paper. Soon, members of the Brotherhood emerged from the shadows and led Gara to a section forbidden to Easterners. He noticed something that made him raise an eyebrow. They came to a halt in front of a ramen shop with the neon sign Ikaraku Ramen. When Tuchai and Ayim saw Gara, they were getting ready to close. We're sorry, but we're about to. Keisuke sama oh, Tuchai stated. Were you looking for something? Although we are closing for the evening, we can still prepare something for you. In any case, our usual midnight customer is about to arrive. Midnight client. It can't be, exclaimed Gara. A flash of yellow appeared, followed by an old face Gara hadn't seen in a long time. Naruto had definitely grown taller than him, and his baby face had completely vanished. Instead, a handsome chiseled face scarred by war replaced it, but his whiskers remained recognizable. His hair had grown longer, but the sun-kissed blonde spiky hair was still there. He was dressed in civilian clothes, a white shirt and blue jeans. What's up, Gara? Naruto inquired. Gara laughed at Naruto's casual demeanor. Naruto, are you still the same as before? Never, ever change, Gara said as he sat down. He ordered shrimp ramen, while Naruto went with his usual. Gara decided to ask after they had eaten in silence for a while. So you've spent your entire life in the West. Naruto nodded his head in agreement. I see. Come to Suna if you miss the East. I can guarantee your safety if you ever decide to join my forces. Though I will have to persuade your emperor. Could you possibly set up a meeting with him? Tuchai and Aim laughed, perplexing Gara until Naruto's next sentence made his mouth drop open. Gara, I am the emperor of the Imperial West. It would be difficult for me to leave my people he laughed. Gara stared at him for a moment before his normally stoic face cracked and he burst out laughing. I see you didn't fulfill your Hakage dream, but instead turned to a much bigger dream, Gara said. Gara made a serious face before bowing to Naruto after they finished eating. I thank you for rescuing Matsuri, one of my shinobi and a dear friend. Is there anything I can do to get this debt paid off? He inquired formally. Naruto dismissed it with a wave of his hand don't be concerned. Except for Sasuke team, I wasn't going to let anyone die because of a rule violation. The two friends talked for a while before parting ways, giving Gara time to return to his bed. They agreed to talk about treaties before they parted ways. He fell asleep for the first time in ages thanks to a special seal tag Naruto had given him. It would keep Shukaku from controlling his body while he slept. The second day of the weapons tournament had arrived, and everyone was looking forward to seeing what would happen. Even though he had been forbidden, Sasuke decided to show up for once, hoping to steal some moves with his Sharingan. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our second day of the weapons tournament. Eric said, the arena has been set up behind me, as you can see. Please, Kagura and Sabaku no Temuri, come up to the stage. Temuri jumped onto the stage quickly before flourishing her fan out, revealing all three moons on her fan. She intended to go all out for this performance. She was wondering where Kagura was when she heard someone call for her to look up. She noticed a massive feather floating down into the ground and realized Kagura had been riding on it. Naruto and Hinata were giggling in the Emperor's box. Kagura was known for making grand entrances. As she approached the ground, Kagura jumped off her feather and shrank it before reattaching it to her hair bun. Are both fighters prepared? Eric inquired. They nodded in agreement. Then start. When Temuri decided to introduce herself first, they both got into fighting position and prepared to attack. Kagura, Temuri is my given name. Back at home, 
However, I am also known as the Mistress of Wind. This title will not be bestowed upon me unless I defeat you. Tegura replied with a chuckle very good. So, let's see who deserves the title. They both swung their fans at full force at the same time. Their winds collided in the center of the arena and battled for supremacy. Wind sword jutsu. Temuri swung once more, hoping to get through. Kagura countered the attack with Dance of Blades, negating it. She used her sickle weasel technique, hoping to trap Kagura in a tornado. When she became desperate, Kagura blew it away with a wave of her fan. Temuri immediately followed with Scythe Weasel Jutsu, her most powerful technique. Not too shabby. Then try this, the Dragon's Dance. Tornadoes erupted from Kagura's fan and collided with Temuri's technique. Dust was blown all over the place, covering both fighters. Temuri was already in the air as the dust settled, swinging her fan down towards Kagura with a roar. While Kagura moved her fan up to block, Temuri expected Kagura to dodge rather than block, given that Kagura's fan shouldn't be able to stop her own. However, rather than striking Kagura or even piercing her fan, it was stopped on impact. Temuri was taken aback, but she didn't dwell on it. Instead, she used her strength to push it down, forcing Kagura to back up to avoid it. Temuri quickly opened her fan and used her wind jutsu and Kagura upon landing, hoping to blow off the ring. Kegura dispelled the wind once more before it reached her. She didn't expect Temuri to throw her fan at her right after her jutsu, though. The heavy fan hit Kaguragrunt in the stomach and blew her off the arena. However, before she landed, she quickly waved her fan at the ground, creating a gust of wind. Kegura was able to reorient herself to the arena. When she landed, she was greeted by ten kunais racing towards her. She created a gust of wind and blew them up, scattering the attack. Temuri slashed her with a kunai, but Kagura deflected the attack with her fan. They broke apart after gritting their teeth in a deadlock. Temuri quickly opened a scroll and pulled out a backup battle fan. Kagura smirked as they looked each other in the eyes. It's time I put an end to this, she said aloud. Temuri kept her cool by performing another wind jutsu with her fan. However, the attack died out before it even reached the halfway point. What? Temuri exclaimed. She was confident that she had enough chakra. She tried once more but received the same result. Aerokinesis is one of my abilities, Kagura explained. Many people can produce and use wind. I, on the other hand, am not limited to that. I have control over the wind. If you want to use wind-based attacks against me, they'll have to be much stronger than what you're doing now in order to be beyond my control. I must warn you that only a few people, such as the Emperor, have the ability to launch wind attacks that are beyond my control. Temuri clenched her teeth as she tried again and again, only to fail. She knew how Tenten felt during their first Chunin exam, when all of her favorite attacks were rendered ineffective. Because wind-based attacks were ineffective, she resorted to using her fan as a blunt club. She struck as hard as she could while also incorporating her personal Taijutsu techniques with her battle fan. Finally, Kagura used Dance of Dragon to end the match and blew her off the arena. Kagura used another gust of wind to quickly slow Temuri's descent to a gentle thump on the floor before she slammed into it. And we've got a winner. This match is won by Kagura of the West. Eric roared as the audience applauded. Temuri noticed her other battle fan in front of her as she stood up. She looked up to see Kagura's smirking face. She had always had a haughty expression on her face, but it seemed much softer now. Not bad. Kagura said, you're not like those stubborn people who try to use the same attacks even though they don't work. Temuri laughed, I'll still find a way to win using my wind jutsu. I can't have the title Mistress of the Wind if you can defeat all of my moves with a single thought. Do you want to grab some food with me if we have time? I'd like to discuss wind techniques, particularly your dances. Before agreeing, Kagura laughed. They exchanged respectful handshakes as they walked towards the waiting room where a healer awaited them. Now it's time for a battle of the titans. Guts vs Zoro. Two fighters with similar destructive techniques. I'm exiting the arena for this fight, Eric declared. The two swordsmen drew their weapons quickly before glaring at each other. In the background, Suaijsu was cheering for his idol. Both fighters had only one eye, which the Easterners noticed. They both dashed forward and swung their weapons with all their might as soon as the announcer started the fight. There was a resounding sound from the weapons colliding followed by a shockwave that blew the audience back. The only way to describe this fight after that was war. Both swordsmen refused to give up, despite receiving serious injuries that should have stopped them. The two fought with all their souls, slash after slash, stab after stab. 
This fight held the attention of the entire audience. Mifune and his samurais were impressed and hoped to reach an agreement with the West to share sword techniques. Guts quickly put on his armor and donned the dog helmet to push himself even further. Normally, he would have gone unconscious and a berserk spirit would have taken his place. But ever since the Emperor had assisted him in saving Casca and even Griffith, he had learned to completely shut down the berserk spirit and regain full control of the armor. Despite this advantage, they were still evenly matched. Both fighters were trying to catch their breath after what seemed like hours but was actually only 40 minutes. Zoro was covered in cuts, and Guts' armor was riddled with gashes from his blood. They both stood up again, and everyone knew it was their final assault. Zoro had used his nine sword style to its full potential, but he couldn't keep it up. Guts' helmet was receding as a result of constant use. Before charging for the final time, they exchanged glances. Zoro spun his two swords in front of him like a windmill, while Guts held his sword high. R-A-A-A-H-H-H. Guts swung his blade down, roaring. Aogi Santoryu, Sanzen Sekai. Zoro exclaimed. A bright flash filled the arena, briefly blinding the audience. They noticed that Zoro and Guts had switched places, with their backs to each other. There was silence all around as the audience held their breath. Zoro stumbled and spat blood, causing the audience to gasp. When blood spurted out of Guts's chest, it appeared that he had won. Guts slid backwards, bleeding. Roranoa Zoro is the winner. Can we get some doctors here? They're bleeding profusely, Eric stated. Healers rushed onto the stage and carried both of them away to be healed. Nice fight, Zoro said to Guts. I'll win next time, Guts replied, chuckling. The audience was cheering for such a fight, while the Easterners were debating whether or not to compete in the tournaments. They were repeatedly shown to be in way over their heads here. They'd heard about the West before, and how they'd been warned about it. Many people did not believe in such old legends or thought they were superior. Even with the Sharingan, Sasuke couldn't seem to imitate the West's style. He couldn't see Zoro's slashes, and even if he could imitate Guts, he lacked the muscle for it. He needed to find something from the West that would allow him to murder his brother. Konoha had nothing to offer other than some civilian women connected to the civilian council throwing themselves at him. They were, however, too weak for him and he desired strong women to carry his strong genes. He turned to face Orochimaru. Perhaps a Sanin could assist him in moving forward. Konoha was no longer interested in him. The next match was a quick one. Meliodas and Kenshin were speed and technique equals. Meliodas announced his intention to give up after a few minutes of slashing because he didn't feel like it anymore. He stated that he felt his time was better spent selling his drinks and making sure Hawk wasn't pigging out again. That reasoning was criticized by everyone but Kenshin was allowed to advance to the next round. Our next match is in Zu vs. Mifune. Eric exclaimed, Will Mifune's experience help him defeat his opponent? Or will Inzu's youth carry him through? Let's find out right now. Inzu and Mifune both drew their swords. Mifune was intrigued by Inzu's techniques because he did not appear to be as muscular as Zoro or Guts. It also helped that his sword seemed to be communicating with him as if they were partners, even if they insulted each other. May our blades guide each other, Mifune said, respectfully bowing to Inzu. And may our swords never waver, Inzu replied bowing before rising and scratching his chin. I hope that was sufficiently respectful. I'm not particularly gifted with words. Passable. Mifune replied as he took his stance, his sword in his sheath, indicating he was an Elido master. Take care, Enzu. This old man is no laughing matter his black sword issued a warning. Mifune was soon slashing faster than most people could see. Even Itachi struggled to see the slash with their sharing and Enzu, on the other hand, was guided by instinct and avoided it. Damn that's fast, Enzu said as he deflected another strike from Mifune before slashing the air again. Mifune's eyes widened as he noticed the slash and he quickly dodged to the left. The slash cut a piece of his hair. Such blade mastery at such a young age, Mifune reflected. If this boy was born in the east, he would undoubtedly be my heir and would have taken over for me already. This is getting too old for me. As Nzu engaged him in sword range, he had no time for such thoughts. Mifune was forced to abandon his idol practice when Nzu refused to give him enough time to sheath his blade after an attack. This fight was not as brutal as Zoro and Guts, but it was more refined. Those two were all about strength, while these two were all about finesse. It was a beautiful sight to behold, but it had to come to an end. Mifune channeled his chakra into his sword while backing away to give Yai some breathing room. He then swung with all his strength and speed at Nzu. Nzu's sword is his target. He hoped to either break it or disarm Nzu. Nifune struck Nzu's sword with that in mind. Instead of trying to avoid or block the sword, Nzu slashed downwards to meet it head on. 
a loud noise was heard, and a blade was shattered. Mifune's sword was the one that broke. Mifune appeared dazed after discovering that his chakra-infused blade, as well as a technique he developed to destroy blades, had been broken. The blade of Enzu was not amused. The blade yelled, Why -E -O -O -W 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 what the hell happened, Enzu? I may be impervious to pain, but that doesn't mean I can't feel it. Indestructible, wondered Sasuke. I require that blade. I could use it to kill my brother. He planned how to return the blade to its rightful owner, unaware that the blade would never choose him. Mifune glanced at his blade before declaring his forfeit. While Enzu and Mifune shook hands, the crowd applauded. Such abilities at such a young age, Mifune remarked. If you have time, come over to my lands and meet my fellow samurais. Someone like you can always teach us something. It would be nice to travel to your place, but I don't think Iremi would allow it. Inzu chuckled before scratching his cheek. ID versus Chijiro is our fifth match. Begin when you are ready. Eric declared. Hello, Chijiro. You must not lose or you will embarrass our Mizukich. Suaijsu was mocked. Chijiro blushed at this, but his face seemed to gain a lot of focus after that. He dashed forward towards ID with his weapon hurrying carry in hammer form as soon as he heard the fight begin. He swung it down against his opponent as hard as he could. On impact, a massive dust cloud formed, covering the fighters. I was only teasing him. I didn't expect him to go all out like that. Oh well. It just goes to show that Kiri isn't as weak as the West, Suaitsu stated. The dust settled, and the Easterners were surprised to see ID block the hammer with his sword without much effort. Not bad, ID said as he swung his sword causing Chijiro to back off. Chijiro grunted before attempting various sword techniques he had learned. They were all easily parried by ID, though some appeared to be impossible to even consider parrying. Chijiro was panting profusely, but ID didn't appear to be tired. He looked at Mizukij, as if gaining confidence from her. He took a deep breath before deciding to give this match his all. He wanted to save the chakra he had stored in Hurinkari for future matches, but he couldn't with this opponent. Full chakra release, Chijiro exhaled. His sword grew longer and sharper, and water streams formed a vortex around him. I'm on my way. Stream piercing. It was outstanding. Chijiro was surrounded by water, which was violently streaming around him like a barrier. And his sword was aimed at ID. This was not a move that could be easily parried. ID appeared to be thinking the same thing. If that's the case, Blood River Sword. First right large river, ID said as he took his place. His right hand held the sword raised at head level while his left hand guided it with two fingers. As he began to move forward, his body shifted so that his left side was in front. Such a light attack will not deter me, yelled Chijiro as he approached ID. He was sure of himself until he heard the next line. Second right abundant. A massive torrential wind suddenly followed ID as he slashed forward, dispelling Chijiro's attack. He was about to respond when he heard another chilling line. The third right the colliding wave. Chijiro was sent spinning away from ID before he realized what was going on. ID had followed up with an upper slash, using all of his momentum to cleanly knock Chijiro away. Chijiro landed face down on the floor, his weapon beside him. He was unconscious, so ID was declared the winner. When she saw Chijiro defeated, the Mizukage clenched her fist, but she was also proud of her shinobi. Chijiro had always struggled with confidence, but using this move without chopping someone to gain confidence was surprising given how well he executed it. In the next match, Kagura faced Zoro. It wasn't as bloodthirsty as before, but Zoro won by disarming Kagura and pointing his blades at her. Kagura sighed, but admitted defeat. Even if she could have used her other move, Dance of the Dead, Zoro would have easily cut through all of them. Following that, it was Enzu versus ID. In reality, it was their swords that were at odds. Since they could both talk, they had always insulted each other and tried to outdo each other. They finally stopped talking when Hisako asked if they wanted to be silenced permanently. Both blades came into contact with each other. Enzu decided to use lightning chakra in his attacks after learning about it from one of his mentors, Edermask. Ida used a variety of techniques to counter, including the phoenix slash. Sasuke's envy grew as he couldn't seem to replicate Enzu's wind slash attack, which used no chakra or Isor D's techniques. Inzu was nearly out of breath after 30 minutes of swordplay, while ID was fine, albeit heavily sweating. Inzu, hurry up. We cannot afford to lose to them. I can't stand hearing Lamia brag Inzu's sword spoke. It's simple for you to say. ID is not the one fighting you Inzu responded. He's countered every one of my techniques and still has some as backup. Not really, ID thought. Some of these moves I don't want to use because they strain my heart, and others' techniques don't use my sword so those are out. 
His growth has been monstrous since he began training with Edermask and other swordsmen. Enzu attempted a last-ditch attack, but ID countered. Enzu decided to give up because he couldn't move. Enzu was confronted by his red-haired female friend Yuzumaki Ayumi as they exited the stage. Let me heal you, Ayumi said. Are you okay? You're never this pleasant. Enzu inquired before receiving a punch to the head from her. Idiot. Why can't you just be grateful? I'll get stronger to protect you. What happened to that? While blushing, Ayumi asked before healing him. Eh, you heard that. Enzu blushed before deciding to remain silent. Edermask laughed, then complimented him on a good fight. ID later stated that he did not want to fight in the finals because he did not want to face monsters. The real reason was that he couldn't afford to strain himself too much again or his heartbeat would become uncontrollable. Okay, this is going to be a heated battle. Speed versus strength. Kenshin versus Zoro. It's the big game. When those two entered the arena, the crowd erupted in applause. When the fight began, both simply stared at each other. Soon after, a single leaf floated down between them. They both struck each other in an instant. The leaf caught in the middle of their weapons and annihilated into pieces. The Kanoa Shinobis shivered. Hopefully, it was just a coincidence and not a forewarning. If they thought Zoro and Guts' fight was impressive, this one left them speechless. Kenshin fought at breakneck speed, but Zoro was able to block some of his attacks and counter with destructive strength. He's improved a lot, muttered Tsunade, recalling Kenshin's swordsmanship as a child. Iwa shivered at the prospect of another Yuzumaki seeking vengeance. Mitsurugryu Haitan, Kuzuryusen. Eight slashes and a hilt stab came at once towards Zoro who blocked them with his Asura blade dance. What? I had no idea which slash came first. Yelled Sasuke with my Sharingan. I should be able to tell. The majority of the Easterners were also taken aback. Mifune considered himself fortunate to have lost. He wanted to challenge Kenshin again. But given how much Kenshin had improved, he knew it would be futile because he would lose badly. They fought at close quarters, never retreating unless their techniques demanded it. Cannon weighing 1080 pounds. A wind blast much stronger than Zoro's used against B flew towards Kenshin. Instead of attempting to avoid, Kenshin raised his blade to the sky before slamming it to the ground. Doryusen, heightened Mitsurigryu. Ground fragments flew directly into the wind blast, blocking Zoro's attack. Let's finish this, Zoro-san, Kenshin said as he took an Elido position. Zoro roared as he sheathed his swords. Come on then. He pulled the one with the white scabbard from his belt and held it perpendicular to the ground, sheathed behind his leg. With his left hand near the guard and his right hand on the hilt, he held the sheath. Kenshin charged forward, while Zoro remained in his horse stance. Mitsuryugi Ryo Haitan. Yai Idoryu. There was a loud clash and a flash of light. They could tell that both fighters had their backs to each other as soon as the light went out. Harinki no Amakakaru. Zoro's chest was slashed open, and blood poured out. Zoro's body was swaying and falling to the ground. When Zoro took a step forward to regain balance, the audience thought it was over, that Kenshin had won. Despite his severe injuries, Zoro's sword was slowly being resheathed. Sans and Shishishi. Kenshin's chest is suddenly pierced by a massive sword wound. During the fight, both received serious sword wounds. The audience, particularly the Easterners, were perplexed as both fighters attempted to regain their breath. What the hell happened? That was too fast for even me to catch. I exclaimed. They slashed each other. But how? Dara wondered. A shinobi appeared from the shadows, startling the cages. Koyuki chuckled before deciding to explain what she had just heard to the rest of them. Kenshin's ultimate technique is usually extremely lethal. If you choose to block his attack, you must do so in a unique way or use a unique sword. Otherwise, his sword will slash and break yours. Even if you manage to parry it, something happens. I won't go into detail, but just know that even if you avoid the flying heavenly dragon's fangs, the gusting winds will limit your mobility and the claws will rip you apart. Tsunade asked the big question, then what did Zoro do? The cages shivered at this description. Fufu, please allow me to explain, a voice said. They were all looking for a woman with a startling light blue eye and black hair, as well as a well-shaped bust and waist. Robin, Nico, it's good to see you're doing well, Koyuki stated. She bowed respectfully before continuing. Instead of blocking or striking Kenshin's attack, my husband, Zoro, decided to confront it head on. He reduced the amount of damage he could take by leaning back when he felt the sword cut through his chest, preventing it from completely severing him. Instead, he slashed at Kenshin. That's suicidal, exclaimed Mei. Indeed, that would be my husband. However, he has such incredible endurance that he decided to take a chance and slash back Robin responded. 
Back in the arena, both swordsmen were struggling to get back up after collapsing. In the end, Eric declared that the first person to stand up and declare himself the winner would win, despite the fact that neither fighter could even attack. In the end, it was Zoro who was able to stand up and make that statement, making him the victor. The Easterners were beginning to doubt their chances as the crowd dispersed. Some people believed they still had a chance, but they were few and far between. While they returned to their respective homes, Orochimaru and Tsudamu were already plotting how to conquer the West. They reasoned that the people who had exposed them were trained professionals, and that the majority of their soldiers were actually weak. They hoped to defeat those who were truly powerful through overwhelming numbers, suicide attacks, and or assassinations. Mei was the last of the cages to depart. Before she could leave, a member of the Brotherhood stopped her and handed her a piece of paper. Our Emperor would like to invite you and one other person to dinner. Please follow the instructions on this paper if you accept. Tell no one about this encounter, before vanishing into the shadows, said the messenger May quickly tucked the note beneath her clothes in her left chest. She couldn't afford to pass up this opportunity to speak with the Emperor. She chose Ao as her dinner companion without hesitation. As night fell and the meeting time approached, May excused herself while dragging Ao under the guise off rejucating him on his words. The other Kiri ninjas either winced, like Chijuro, or laughed, like Suaijsu. As Ao cried crocodile tears, Ao felt better after she dragged him away and revealed that she had an invitation to see the emperor. They walked to the location where they were instructed to wait. Hands suddenly gripped them and drew them into the shadows. They fought at first, but the Brotherhood messengers told them to stop and let them blindfold them before meeting the emperor. They and Ao agreed, but they were surprised when they pulled out a specialized seal and placed it on Ao's eye patch. They felt a hand on their shoulder as soon as they were blindfolded before being teleported. They initially felt nauseous but quickly recovered. When they were allowed to remove their blindfolds, they were astounded to discover that the emperor was actually Uzumaki Naruto. He was dressed as an emperor but did not wear his mask. Yudakata was right next to him, blowing on his bubble pipes once more. They and Ao bowed respectfully in front of the emperor. Please stand up, Naruto said. Yudakata has put in a good word for you. So my counsel and I have decided to give Kiri the opportunity to speak. Mei was thanking whatever deity it was that she had never mistreated Yudakata. She remembered how many Shinobi in the past despised Yudakata because he was a Jinchuriki and saw him as a demon. While they were discussing trades and potential treaties, Naruto had a clone have a private conversation with Itachi. Are you sure about this? Naruto inquired. Yes, Naruto, Itachi replied. I have earned a place in that. For my own safety, I will not back down now. I intend to inform everyone about who they're dealing with, as well as to reveal the long hidden secrets. I will continue the story in next part, so turn on the bell notification so you never miss an upload. Till then, we weave off like.